Hi everybody. So here we are, week two. Um, we're gonna do a really light lecture today. Um, I know everybody has a lot of things going on, a lot coming in. Um, it seems like it's a light lecture for you guys, but the production effort for this was huge. Um, today we're gonna be talking about structural drawings and tributary area. Um, and I'm going to loosely start to talk about the project going forward, just to kind of give you a loose intro to it. Um, the, the structural drawings have been that I had been using are an example project that um, my predecessor had gotten from his predecessor. So these drawings were 30 years old and being used again and again and again. Um, and some of the lingo is out of date and just the method of how we look at the drawings has changed a little bit. Um, so I wanted to set out and create a new drawing set. I also wanted to create one that was designed so that uh, it had a matching design model, loads that made sense, sizes that made sense. So going forward, we can use that throughout this term and next term to create, to, to analyze beams um, and compare those to sizing guidelines with the final design and kind of really work through the entire process. Um, it is chaos here. I have a four-year-old trying to do online learning. He just wrapped up for the day, but it was three hours in segments online with a two-year-old running around and a husband who's on conference call after conference call. So you will see, periodically see, see people run through the background. Hopefully they're not on fire. Uh, if so, let me know so I can, you know, throw water on them or something. Um, uh, so the, the drawings I've created, um, it ended up being a huge task because I needed to create this building twice for you guys. Um, and it's something that we'll reference again and again, um, just to kind of give you context. If this was an actual building that was being designed, it would have been, you know, a four to six week project of full-time work. Um, and I decided to do this about two weeks ago. So it was jamming a lot in, um, but they're there now. They're not as far along as I would have loved to have given you. I would have loved matching sections through the building uh, that you could reference kind of what happens here when we see these kind of weird steps. Um, but I'm gonna work on that throughout the year. Uh, hopefully those will be done for you guys. If not, next year's crew will definitely get them. But the, the state of these, I think, are in, in a much better shape than um, kind of the last year and years in past, they were just screen captures in the presentation. What I've done is I've actually made a PDF set print of these drawings that are uploaded in your downloads module. So you can go there and download the basic drawings set. Actually, it's in um, helpful uh, structural drawings, I believe. Um, also in there is two projects that um, uh, I designed when I was working at Blackwell that the architects were also willing to um, allow, allow us to upload their architectural drawings. So you can look at the structural drawings side by side with the architectural drawings. One of the really great things there is that one of the projects had to be designed twice. Uh, it had to be designed in steel and then again in concrete. The steel version um, it was a, a great version of the project. We had produced the drawings, it went out for permit. Um, and then it was about 2008 and there was a, uh, a steel shortage essentially in North America. Um, China had produced, uh, had uh, scooped up a lot of the North American steel. Um, so prices here doubled in about a month. Uh, so it went out to, to tender, the prices came back astronomically high. Uh, the owner was a little annoyed, kind of like, why would you do this? Why would you let us build this expensive building? Um, so we had to kind of explain that sometimes the market is beyond our control. Things like that don't happen very often, but we've seen a few of them um, in the past little while. I mean, we're in the midst of one right now where we it's not even predictable. We don't even know what's happening with the market right now. Um, uh, but we went and redesigned that building in concrete to try to get a better price. Um, of course, redesigning a new building, uh, even though it's almost the same building, it's a new building and there was some changes made. Uh, we redesigned it in concrete and they didn't go for tender until a year later. We had originally picked steel because steel was the cheaper option for that building. And then by the time it actually went out for tender and concrete, steel was back down to its normal price. Uh, so in the end, it, the steel would have gotten them the better price um, had we just held on to those drawings for a little while. But 
that wasn't a decision we could have known. That that seems so obvious in hindsight, but it wasn't clear at the time that that was going to be the issue. Anyway, those drawing sets are all uploaded for you just so you can kind of look into them, get a feel for them, see what structural drawings look like, but also have a set of architectural to kind of help you along your way. So like I said, today's just going to be a short lecture. We're going to go through some kind of really loose stuff. Your assignment's been posted. Um, take a chance to really read the questions. You have a week to get that assignment done. Uh, read the questions, see what I'm asking for. Don't hit submit until you're sure you've submitted what I've asked for. If it's a numerical fill in the blank, I have been explicit of what I want to see, including how many decimal spaces without the units because I've written the units in the question. So all you need to put is the numerical answer to the decimal spaces that I have requested. Um, and that is the only thing that will be allowed to be put in there. So let's just start with kind of some of the nomenclature that we use in engineering on structural drawings most specifically. So the shorthand for how we write things. Um, here are some of the common ones over here. CC would be center to center or on center. That means something happens that often. We, we see that thing repeated again and again at that exact spacing. Can't means cantilever. Usually writing cantilever takes up too much space on the page, so we'll write can't. Uh, CA often means uh, column above. GA, ah, gauge, GA, gauge. So if we're talking about um, relatively thin metals, we'll often refer to it as the gauge, which has an associated thickness with it, whether it's a thin metal or a screw. Uh, anybody who's purchased um, screws from Home Depot know that they're often referenced by a gauge for that screw. Uh, so you can Google those and see what thicknesses they are. We're not gonna use gauge that often in this course. If so, I would give you the actual thickness in millimeters. KN, kilonewtons. Uh, we're gonna talk about that a lot. We're gonna use kilonewtons extensively throughout the next two courses. If you see MC, it means moment connected. You'll often see a little solid triangle, um, at, which would also mean moment connection. Sometimes MOM, moment. Uh, OWSJ, open web steel joist. So those are the st are steel joists that you would see if you went into any uh, Loblaws or Home Depot um, or Walmart and looked up at the ceiling, Often they have these repeated trusses. They look like small trusses, but they're mass produced um, uh, and you get a bunch of them on a project and they're all identical doing the same job. Um, R would often mean, uh, it depends. Usually we're talking about a reaction. It could mean radius depending on the context. So sometimes you have to be smart and look at what we're talking about. SOG is slab on grade. We're gonna do some stuff with slab on grades at the end of the term. I usually have a question on the exam involving a slab on grade that we'll learn in the last lecture. And UN, unless noted. So often we'll say tip unless noted. So typical, unless noted, means this is the way it is everywhere in the project unless we have another note. So if you don't see anything beside it, we want this done. Um, the other thing that you're often going to see is CF for factored compressive resistance. Remember that little sub F means that we've factored the loads. Uh, same thing for tension, shear, and moment, or even torsional. Sometimes we'll write TOR with the sub F, but usually there'll be contexts that let you know what we're talking about. And we're not really going to do anything with torsion in this course anyway. I just want you to see that these things show up in the drawings. If you recall, I said that we're going to work on everything on the load side of this equation for ultimate limit states this term and everything on the material side in second term. So these things that have been highlighted here are many of the things that this course is leading to. How do we calculate CF, TF, MF, and VF on a member? And that is the ultimate goal of what we're going to complete by the end of this course. So you saw me, you heard me reference open web steel joists or OWSJ. This is just an image of what they look like. It's probably something you've all seen. 
One of the interesting things here, see this little, we call this the shoe. Um, metal deck would come and sit directly on this joist, but the thing this sits on is dropped down a little bit. I often see people in projects and reports draw the steel beam way under here at the bottom. Nope, it's gonna be right here near the top of it. Just drop down a tiny little bit. It's about four inches for most projects. It can be more, but four inches is about what we end up dropping it. That was just, we're gonna definitely talk about open web steel joists when we get into steel members uh, and different kind of common construction build types. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick look at what that was since I mentioned it. These are common hatching types that you're gonna see on projects a lot. Um, on this page, the one that you'd probably see the most would be earth or uh, fill or sand. Sometimes this fill sand option we might use for concrete if it's at a, uh, a large scale project or small, depending on how you're talking about it, but like one to a hundred or greater. Concrete and masonry. Um, if we're talking about brick, we'll have a really tightly spaced dashed line block would have a wide spacing. If it's reinforced or grout filled, you'll see that turn into the crosses going both ways or the slashes going both ways. Cast concrete, we actually show little triangles with sand. Those little triangles <coughs> are the aggregate or the rock that are showing up in it. Um, reinforced concrete, you'll also often see the reinforcing drawn in. That doesn't mean the cast concrete doesn't have reinforcing on it, in it. It just depends on the scale and what the context of what we're showing is. Uh, grout in a small scale thing would often be displayed as sand. These two for concrete, if it's like a one to a hundred, sometimes I use the sand just because it's a little easier to kind of see what's going on. Um, steel, we have in different shapes. If we're talking about a, a plan drawing, we'll often just draw the outline. But if we're cutting through it in a section, for example, we'll show it with these slash lines. And it's usually too tight together with a space. You know, th this hatching drawing always bugs me a little bit. It shows copper and aluminum. I'm kind of lazy. I often usually just do the same hatching as steel and make a note that it is aluminum or copper um, that we are talking about there. So, you know, these are general guidelines, but some of them you can kind of, as long as what you're doing makes sense and you explain what you're talking about, you can be somewhat lenient. These aren't rules, they're just guidelines. Wood, um, a wood pattern for a wall and plan just kind of shows that we're looking at you know, that kind of wavy line you might see in wood if we were cutting circles. Plywood in sections, we often have either three slash lines close together or four slash lines. One time a student got really mad that one of my details only had three slash lines side by side. So that's the thing you want to get upset about, have at her, but uh, people are going to understand that if it's a few slash lines with a, a gap beside it, especially the context of a, a very narrow thing. We're talking about cutting through ply plywood. Hatching is a thing we use when we're cutting the element. If we're looking at something beyond and what we're drawing doesn't cut through it, we wouldn't hatch it. So hatching is when we're cutting through an element we're talking about. So often if we're cutting a section, we might cut through a beam or we might cut, cut through a column in our drawing and those things would be hatched. Sounds like little finicky things, but you can read a lot into a set of drawings by knowing where it's cut and what's hatched and what's not. Um, so I've, like I said, I've created two sets of drawings of the same building. I've done it in steel and I've done it in concrete. Kind of the big things I want you to be looking at is grid identification, grid dimensions, these are easy ways to get points kind of going through in your projects later on. Labels for things, are all of your beams labeled? Do they have a name? Will I know what you're talking about? What size is everything? Again, you don't have a clue right now what size things could be. So we're gonna talk about that going on throughout the term. But even if you haven't done a final design, I am going to give you the ability to do a preliminary size. So if you don't know what it is, you should at least be putting a preliminary size on as a placeholder for context. Um, uh, framing. 
Um, what is the layout? Where are things spanning to? What's picking it up? Does it make sense? So is there a gravity system? Is it stable? And if wind were to blow on it or seismic loads to come, in, come along, is it stable? I.e., does it have a lateral load resisting system? So that means something in the walls that stops it from tipping over. Again, you don't know what a lateral load resisting system is yet, but we're going to talk about that a lot throughout this term and you're going to need to be able to identify it. But just for a quick kind of feedback, that's a, a concrete shear wall, a wood shear wall, um, a steel braced frame, a steel moment frame. Those are all things that can be lateral load. But you can even have a block wall, shear wall, lateral load resisting system. And you should be paying attention to where cantilevers are. If something is cantilevering, it has an impact on the design. We need to understand where that is, and graphically it needs to be represented in our drawing. So like I said, these drawings are available as a full PDF on Quercus. You also have this PowerPoint presentation that shows them in it, but it might be easier sometimes to just open up the drawings. So we get into it here. I think what I might do is actually just open up the PDF because we might find the PDF a little bit easier to look at because I can zoom in. So look here, we've got grid lines. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four, and we've got dimensions between the grid lines. That's really important. We need to be able, we need to, be able to tell someone how to build this and how much it's gonna cost. We don't have to tell them how much it's gonna cost. They're the experts on that but they have to be able to figure out how much it's gonna cost by knowing how much material of each thing they need. There's debate about whether engineers should put dimensions on their drawings. Well, that works as long as the architect has grid lines on their drawings. So if you're not gonna have them on there, you need to know that the architect does. But if you don't have a set of architectural drawings, these dimensions have to show up somewhere. So, for example, for you guys in projects, more second term, not this term quite as much, but if you're going to have a set of drawings, you're going to need dimensions on those grid lines because all I'm looking at is your structural drawings. So without those grid lines, I have no sense of context. We can see here that we've got footings and we've got something that's hatched here. So the hatching is what we're cutting through. So it's important to know where we're cutting. Foundations, we often cut and look down. So somewhere just above the foundation, we're cutting through and looking down at our footings. So this building, it looks like we have two zones here. This is unexcavated, and this looks like there's something on the ground below. So it seems like this building has a basement in this zone here, and this doesn't have a basement. So there's something above us, but we're cutting just before the ground floor and looking down. So we're looking at the basement floor here, and then this is where they're backfilling into that zone. But over here, we'd be cutting through the foundation wall and seeing our foundations. So we've got footings below piers, we've got walls, and we've got footings. Over here, we're also seeing the slab on grade below us. So we're looking down at the basement floor. That means that if this is the line of the footing on this side, to see the footing, we're looking through the slab on grade. That means it's hidden because it's beyond what we're looking at. So here it's shown dashed because we're looking through the slab on grade to see that footing. So you can see some of these notes here. Here's a note that says what that basement slab is. So you can see I've labeled it BS01 or basement slab one. Maybe I only have one slab, maybe I have 10 different kinds. It's handy to start a naming system early in the project and be consistent throughout it. There's lines designating saw cuts here. Saw cuts help control cracking. It does not eliminate it. You need to tell every single client concrete cracks. You can't get away from it, it will crack. We can help mitigate it, we can do things to limit it, but concrete will crack. Oddly enough, one of the biggest lawsuits 
or multiple lawsuits I've seen on projects are where the client gets it into the head, their head that concrete shouldn't have cracks on it and they sue everyone involved. They're not right, um, but it doesn't mean lawyers might settle it that way. Um, so it's helpful to just be explicit to your client from day one that concrete cracks. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. Cracking can be irrelevant in concrete, for concrete capacity and strength and how it behaves. Um, over here, we've got a stairwell um, going down into the basement. It looks like I uh, have no doorways out of this basement. There should be a doorway drawn in this. And so if we're cutting and looking down, we'd be cutting through the doorway. So there should be a zone here that has no hatching in it because there's not technically a wall there. So we should show that without that existing there. We're cutting somewhere in the middle of the stairs. So we're showing that the stairs start here and go up and come around. So we should have a doorway right here. In our stairwell, we have a sump pump. So this needs to be dropped down somewhat. Over here again, I should have a doorway, but this is an elevator pit. Um, it's got a slab in the bottom of it, and often elevator pits are about five feet below grade. The effect of the basement and this elevator pit is that our foundations are deeper than they might be over here. If we don't have a reason to, our foundations will usually go down four feet below grade, and that's all about frost. We then have to make sure that the soil is strong enough to bear our loads there. If it's not, the geotechnical report might tell us we need to go even deeper than that. If we have a basement, obviously our footings have to be below our basement, so we might go down even more. So over here, we don't have a basement and we only need to go down for frost. Here you can see the underside of footing is at in geodetic values. It's going to vary around the building because we start to drop down. There is a mistake in this that I need to fix. This should be higher than this because we're supposed to be stepping down. So I am going to update that and reprint these. It's not gonna be a big impact. Underside. So I can update those. Not a big impact for you guys, it's just a small thing and if I'm doing this, I wanna do it right. Um, but you can see that our footing starts to come down. And we call that a step down footing. Um, we have to start to bring our footing down in segments. I've also uploaded for you guys a drawing called typical details. In that is a typical detail about step down footings or how we start to bring our footing down. Um, one of the things it says is you can only go down so much at once and that can only be over such an amount of distance. So if we have to drop our footing down more than that, we have to do it in segments. So you can see here that there's a step down footing here and a step down footing here. And then over here, we need to drop down even more. So step down footings here and step down footings here down to this low part. We've got some notes under plan here, um, talking about what our geodetic elevation is. Um, we, uh, it's saying that the, the cross denoted local datum is for raised or lowered areas. Um, it says that anything that is cross denoted is relevant to that or referenced from that. Um, found footings at the geodetic elevation shown in plan. So these are those, those geodetic elevations that I was talking about, the underside of footing that I have to fix for a few. It says all footings to be 1.22 meters um, min for frost protection. So about four feet below grade for frost protection. And then it says found all, all footings on soil capable of supporting ULS of 150, L -L -L SLS of 100. And we'll talk more about that later in the term. So next let's take a look at our ground floor plan. So here we're essentially cutting in the same spot 
and looking up now. So we're looking at the framing above it. So we're standing on the floor and looking up at this ceiling here. And somebody's cutting through and looking up. So that means everything that's shown here is below this floor. We're looking up at this. So any of these beams means they're the beams we're looking up at from underneath. So here is our slab on grade for that ground floor. So this is at grade. We're now cutting through the foundation wall looking up, which means we can't see the footings anymore. Uh, we've got our stairwell and our elevator opening. Um, you can see here that we've got concrete on metal deck. We've called it ground slab 02 because this was ground slab 01. And it says that it's 64 concrete on 38 metal deck. We're gonna talk about that more as well and I'm gonna draw you some diagrams of what that means and what the loads look like for that. Um, we've got purlins here. They've been called beams. We're gonna talk about that a bit more when we talk about tributary area, but we've got some beams spanning from this foundation wall to this foundation wall. This concrete on metal deck goes all the way from here, all the way over to here. And these beams, each one is picking up a segment of deck. So this is a continuous piece of deck, but each beam is going to pick up a zone of it. For example, this beam is going to pick up that zone of deck. We've got um, loads here that would exist on that. So we've said live load, typical ground floor loads. We're gonna go, we're gonna do a whole lecture just on loads and how these are broken down. Um, next, we've got our second floor. So now we're cutting just, we're cutting somewhere between the ground and second floor, cutting and looking up. So now we're cutting through steel columns looking up at the underside of the second floor. And we've got a few things going on here that we haven't yet. We've got these dashed lines here. Well, let's take a look. Steel bracing, lateral load resisting system, LLRS. So that's telling us in the wall, there are steel elements that look like that. And that's our lateral load resisting system. That's stopping our building from tipping over. We should always be identifying our lateral load resisting system on our drawings. Um, our, our outline for our building before stopped at grid line two. So it looks like this zone here doesn't have an envelope around it because there's no foundation below it. Canopy outline above shown thus for context. So it looks like this is a canopy. And look over here, it says minus 250. It looks like this zone is dropped relative to this zone. We've got a concrete on metal deck system spanning this way, and we've got some beams here. Looks like we've got another beam out here picking up these ones. Oh, can't, that meant cantilever. So this element looks like it would be designed as one beam with a cantilever hanging off the end. When we talk about snow loads, we're gonna talk about accumulated snow loads. It's not a thing you guys are gonna have to um, uh, calculate, but it's a thing you need to know exists. You can imagine if you have a tall object and snow is going to gather around it. Sometimes it's because it falls off of the thing above. Sometimes it's about it being sheltered and providing um, wind shelter, so snow tends to accumulate there. We've got open web steel joists. So this dashed line pattern means an open web steel joist. And then over here we've got purlins. Um, over here, we've got a framing system that's turned. So here, our deck span from here to here, and same with up here. But over here, our deck starts at this line and spans to this line. Here it tells us that we're 38 metal deck with dead load and snow load on it. Sorry, my kid just ran through the room. Um, We've got more bracing here. We've got one big long beam here that goes from grid line A to grid line C. 
And at grid line B, it's got CA, which means column above. So we have a long beam that has a column coming down as a point load on it. You might find it handy throughout the term to go back and look at these drawings because there's a lot captured here that we're going to talk about throughout the term and seeing these things might be really handy. Um, we've broken down loads here. Again, we're going to do a lecture on loading, but we've got interior dead loads, low roof dead loads, and balcony dead loads. So it looks like we could reference these things up here. Our stairwell and elevator are hatching switched. It looks like it says it's 190 masonry block here. Uh, it looks like we've got some framing in our stair and a note that says stair and landing designed by supplier and contractor to coordinate bearing pads. So it looks like some work would have to happen there. Um, we've got large beams here that cantilever out, but look, they're broken at this column. So it looks like something interesting would be happening there. These little triangles are what I said means moment connection. So it looks like something's happening here. But we don't know what any of these sizes are. So we've got things that says sizes. The only thing we know is this joist. It says that it's 600 deep tip. It's all only information we have. If we come over here, we've got a level two beam schedule. And we've got the names that were on the plan along with the beam section. And then we've got reactions. And then we've got top of beam or where that beam sits relative to the world. And then sometimes we've got some notes so these three beams were the ones that had the moment connections. And look, it says uh, right end to, to cantilever, moment connect for this value here. Our last steel plan is our roof plan. It's a lot simpler, it's a little less complex than the second floor. You can see that that roof stepped up and we, we our building envelope is here and we've got another canopy here but this one the framing is in the same plane we've got our lateral load resisting systems shown we've got our our block wall Oops, my kids are going for a walk uh we've got metal deck we've got our metal deck and we've got beams drawn here one of the interesting things is that we show datum points here. As much as we refer to the underside of the deck as zero, often what we'll do is slope the tops of beams to allow us to slope to drain. You can do it different ways. You can keep the steel all flat and build up with insulation or topping. Um, and that's often a very simple way to do it. It's more expensive, but it's more simple. In a relatively basic building, you can slope the steel. You can't do it when you have really complex roof drain layouts and beams that stop and start and continuations and transfers um, because your, your steel can only slope in one direction at a time. But this one is a relatively basic layout. So what we've done is we've said this entire perimeter is at zero. And there's a roof drain right here, so the top of the roof is 150 below the top of the roof here. So all of these steel beams can slope down to this point. We've got notes here that tell us a little bit about what's going on, and we've got our roof beam schedule here. Again, as we go through the term and next term, you're going to have to make your own set of structural drawings. Looking at these is going to be very, very helpful. All right, let's look at our concrete building now. The concrete building in some ways is, um, at least drawing wise, tends to look a little bit um, less complex, but there's some information that's not here that we're not gonna get into that is about um, uh, beam zones and column strips and, and, and slab strips. Um, but everything that we're going to talk about this term is being shown here. The basement plan or the foundation plan isn't that different. Our piers look a little bit bigger because we're going to have concrete columns rather than small steel, steel columns. 
but for the most part, everything else is the same. One interesting thing is that our grid dimensions changed. The overall size of our building hasn't changed though. In a steel building, it's often easiest to make the grid line the center of your column. The columns are relatively small and whether they get bigger or smaller usually doesn't matter because they're usually encapsulated in something like drywall or some sort of cladding system. Concrete, we're talking about much bigger elements. So often a variation in size would mean a weird bump out in the building. So exterior edges of concrete buildings usually all line up. So if our column changes, it might shift in, but this side would stay the same. That means that for exterior lines of, the of, the, of a concrete building, it's often easiest to make the grid line be the outside edge of either our slab or our column. So you can see here that we do have that shift in the grid lines. Our slab on grade stays the same. This is unexcavated. We've still got our stairwell with our elevator pit. Um, on cutting and looking up, so looking at the underside of the ground floor framing plan, instead of beams here, we now have a 300 slab and it's told us some reinforcing. It's also, it hasn't, it's showing us that it's one way, meaning it's spanning from here to here. Concrete can have two way slabs, meaning it's spanning to all of the sides, but that only works when the ratio of side length is small enough. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about concrete siding, sizing guidelines later in the term too. Let's move up a floor where we're cutting above the ground floor, looking up at the underside of the second floor. So here now we've got a 250 two-way slab, so meaning it's spanning to all of the columns with 150 drop panels and 300 capitals. So drop panels and capitals are a thing we do around columns to help deal with punching shear usually. That's usually the kind of the main Thing they're doing. Sometimes they help with a little bit of moment uh, in the way it, or maybe even deflection in the uh, column strips of a slab, but mostly we're talking about um, punching shear. Again, that's a thing we're going to talk about later in the term. I did show you some great failure images of punching shear last week though. Our slab cantilevers out here and it cantilevers, oh it doesn't cantilever out here, but it spans from this grid line to this grid line with the same way we did in the steel one, columns above. So we have a massive transfer here that you can imagine uh, the slab couldn't handle on its own. So what you see here is the nomenclature for a concrete beam. So we've got 700 by 1050. So that is saying that this beam is 700 wide and 1050 deep. That isn't always the way we name things. In our concrete beams, we tend to go with depth. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you all the ways we talk about these things later. You can see here that both of these sides are 700 deep or wide, but this portion is 800 and this portion is 1050. It looks like there is a jog in the beam. What's not clear is, is it the top or the bottom? And I wonder if there's any context that tells us that. And it looks like right here we can see that this zone is minus 250. So it seems like right along this line here, this is the underside of our slab. Let's make that color, make that a bright color. We'll do the same with this. Looks like that is our slab. Again, we have a column coming down and sitting it on it there, but two columns supporting it over here. 
So you can kind of get an idea of what's happening in that cross section of the slab. Um, over here in the last building are uh, walls above the foundation were masonry, masonry block. I don't see a lot of masonry block cores anymore. A core is often the name we give for the elevator and stair set portion of the building. Um, I, I kept that in there just to kind of show some, uh, some masonry in one of the drawings. Lately I find that if it's a steel building, we've got a steel core with bracing in it. If it's a concrete building, we've got a concrete core. If it's a mass timber building, we've got mass timber as our core if the fire code allows it. Um, but we can do a block core in, uh, in that last building. But here we're cutting through concrete now because this is a concrete building. If you're doing a concrete building, why would you switch to masonry? It doesn't make any sense. So once we're doing a concrete building, we're going to keep concrete for the stair core. So here we're cutting and looking up, which means you can see that we're cutting through a doorway and it's not hatched. In the last building, we did a steel stair. In this one, I have precast stair designed by supplier. So in this one, we're saying they're bringing in precast stairs. So coordination needs to happen with that. They could do precast. I mostly just wanted to make a reference here of, uh, of a precast. They, they could do cast in place, um, no problem. Here are some loads for this portion of the building. Um, Drop panels are that region around a column that looks like a square quite often that drops down a little bit. A capital, it can be round, but it looks like a cone or an upside down kind of pyramid that goes from some point down on the column up to the underside of slab. And again, both of those are usually dealing with um, a punching shear. Uh, the roof plan for the concrete building very similar, but slightly less complex, where it looks like all we've got is drop panels, um, including one that does the heavy hitting for this little cantilever right here. So let's come back to our slideshow. We've looked at these drawings now. Like I said, all of those are available on Quercus. You should download them, take a look at them. Um, uh, like I said, I'm going to upload, I'm going to fix the uh, footing underside and upload those. Um, but again, that's almost irrelevant to you guys. Um, I might even add a page that shows, not through it, but it starts to show what's really happening with those foundation walls. Um, do you have to take a call right now? Would you be willing to make me a coffee? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're the best. Thank you. Um, it's been making those drawings was an intense, intense thing, and I finished late, 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 late well, uh, technically this morning. Um, so like I said, I uploaded a few projects for you. You've got Cube Lofts by Raw Architects and Blackwell Engineers, and it was when I was uh, the engineer there, uh, one of the engineers there. So this is the one that's in steel and concrete. Varsity Goldring Center for High Performance Sports, if any of you have had the opportunity, to be in it. It's a gorgeous building that lots of cool stuff is happening. 90% um, of it is simple. 10% um, of it is ridiculously hard. But that 90% of it that's relatively simple is a great thing to take a look at. It is a, a style of construction we haven't talked about yet here, but we will throughout the term, where it's hollow core on steel framing. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a system that I've worked with a lot um, and it shows up in that building. So we'll definitely talk about that going forward. So the thing I wanna talk about just for a few minutes, um, kind of before we wrap up, is I wanna talk about tributary area and tributary width. Because we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at loads on elements. And so it's helpful to understand where those loads come from. And a tributary area is a region or an area that impacts the load of an element. We use it in structural engineering to talk about tributary area and tributary width on columns and beams, but it's not the only place you're probably used to hearing that. You've probably heard it when talking about a watershed. In fact, they're often called a tributary. Um, and the tributary is the region of land that contributes to the volume of water 
in that tributary or that element within the tributary. So it's the same way the region of floor or roof impacts the load on a particular element. And so it's a very similar way to think about things. So I'm going to use this first to talk about it, and then we'll switch to talking about it in the same way about a building. So if you're walking through the woods um, and you come across a running body of water, you'll probably say, oh, look, a river. And you wouldn't think much more about it, but maybe you're the curious sort and you go back and look at a map, um, particularly maybe a, 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 a topographic map or a watershed map and see that they actually, or maybe even maybe just a regular map where they've given that a name and you are confirmed that it is in fact a river. But what if you're walking through the woods and you come across a different body of running water? And you go, oh look, a river. You go back and you look at that same, uh, same map and it tells you that that's a creek. Well, a creek is really the same thing as a river but it's a name we tend to give it to kind of assign a hierarchy within something. Um, it doesn't mean it's not a river. It just means to help us talk about it amongst ourselves. It means that it's a river that's not maybe doing quite as much work as what we call a river. We're going to find that happens in structural engineering when we talk about purlins and beams and girders, which are all beams. They're just fancy names we give them to help us figure out what role it plays in the building or how much, how, how hard it's working is really the way I like to think about it. So you're walking through the woods and you come across another body of water uh, and this one again, you say, oh look, another river. Um, but when you go back and look at a map, you see maybe it's a stream. Now, a stream could drain into a creek or it could drain directly into a river. It doesn't mean that the hierarchy makes it only a sign into, ah, thank you, into a specific thing. Um, it's really talking about the volume within it or its hierarchy within the system. So here we could have a stream framing directly into a river, but often it might just be framing into a creek. What if we add another level of hierarchy to that? And we've got, I don't know, it's smaller than a stream. I think I'd usually call a brook. Smaller than a stream, a brook is like the little tiny thing. Again, this is about how we kind of rank things even in our own head. Um, so a brook, I'm gonna call a brook the, the least hard working of all of the running bodies of water we call rivers. Um, and a brook could drain directly into a stream it could drain into a creek, it could drain directly into a river itself. Now, as you know, anybody who's ever looked at a map of the Mississippi knows it goes all the way from Ohio all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. That is a massive region of North America that that spans through. And if we have a snowstorm in Ohio, it could be sunny um, uh, in Mississippi. So the load that that tributary is experiencing does not need to be equal everywhere in the tributary. We need to know what tributary area has that load on it, even though it's affecting way down here. So this zone up here may be the tributary area seeing the snow, even though we would need to add it up when we're talking about the river. We don't say that that snow happens over the entire tributary of that watershed. We could have snow in Ohio and a hurricane in Mississippi, which has two different loads happening on two different areas, even though they're ultimately impacting the same element at the end of the design. And that's why this hierarchy comes in handy. A brook probably only has one or two load types over a relatively equivalent tributary area impacting its design. As we get down to the elements that are doing the most work, they probably have several different load types coming from several different regions that all experience different tributary areas. So that's why keeping track of what we're talking about can start to be really important. So look down here, our brick, our brook has a very small tributary area. 
our stream, our tributary area gets bigger, but that also increases the likelihood that the, air, the load isn't the same over the entire tributary area. Our creek, bigger still, and our river, again, what I was trying to imply, we could have snow in this portion and rain in this portion, even though this might be considered the entire tributary area of it, this might be the tributary area for our rain load, and this might be the tributary area for our snow load. So let's look at that same drawing, but switch the names of things. Let's talk about it as if it was building elements. Our column might be what we would have called the river, the one that's gathering up all kinds of different things that have different tributary areas, different tributary widths, and different loads on it, but all coming down to impact the design of one element. Our girders tend to be doing a pretty hefty job, but they might have and they might have different areas with different loads on them. Themes start to become a little more straightforward. They might have one or two different loads, they might have something else coming into them, but they start to be, get a little bit simpler to design. Um, my husband just spilled a bowl of food all over the floor. Um, uh, purlins tend to be kind of the, not the smallest, they often happen to be the smallest, but the simplest element in the building. <laughs> it's the walk of shame from having to go get the broom. Um, the, uh, the purlins tend to do the, the, a repetitive job. There's a lot of them doing the same thing. They're not that complex. They probably have one or two load types with the same tributary area again and again and again. <laughs> that is so funny. I'm sorry. His hair is extra today, too. Um, um, so uh, this starts to help us lock in our mind. And it's going to become really important because inevitably later in the term, I'm going to talk about purlins and beams and girders. And they're all beams. They're all the same thing. We don't design them differently, but their hierarchy lets us use different preliminary sizing guidelines when we do that first round of sizing. So understanding if it's a beam, a purlin, or a girder, acknowledging they're all beams, starts to be really helpful in get, giving us some preliminary sizing or preliminary feedback on the element. And like I said, um, you can have different loads in different regions seeing different things. Let's redraw that as if it was an actual building. So our columns, we would have around the perimeter going between floors. Girders usually are doing the heavy lifting. They are probably picking up something hefty like our beams. Our beams are usually pretty simple, but they're often picking up our purlins. And our purlins, which are the simplest, least complex element in our building, are often picking up the deck directly. So they're the thing that we often see repeated quite often with the deck directly on them. That doesn't mean a beam doesn't pick up the deck directly. It just means it also might pick up the deck and the purlins so that we have multiple things um, coming in on those beams. And again, you can have different loading in different regions affecting different things by different amounts. Are you taking a conference call? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's tributary area as a whole. What does it mean when we're talking about tributary width? So tributary width is a thing we do to help keep our analysis a little simpler at a very early stage. That whole thing, that whole element would have a whole tributary area on it. But tributary width, we stop short of looking at the length of it. We build that in. Don't worry, we're going to do lots of work where we build um, length in. But explicitly when we're talking about um, purlins and often beams, what we'll do is look at the width of the roof or the floor that is impacting the design. And that helps us simplify a step of our calculations. I mean, ultimately might confuse the heck out of you guys, but that's the ultimate goal is it lets us keep our thought process 
in a linear uh, process. And I'm gonna go through all of that process with you. We're gonna do it again and again and again and again. And so right now, it's mostly just about you hearing the words and seeing what we're talking about, but we're gonna do these calculations a bunch. So let's look at a really basic, basic floor plan here. We've got two bays of eight meters here and three bays of six meters here. Don't worry about this load. Um, there's some calculations on it that's, that we're gonna that I show in the uh, kind of solutions page of this. That's just for the people that really like to kind of check things out. But this is the load in KPA on the floor. We haven't even talked about that yet. We'll talk about that later in the term. If you feel like it and you wanna practice, when we get to that, you can come back to these ones and check it out and see if it matches with what your understanding is. Um, so you can see that we have these elements that are drawn with this solid, double dashed, solid, double dashed, solid. That's usually the way we draw open web steel joists. Sometimes we'll even draw purlins that way. Um, that's to let us know that it is a thing that is picking up the deck. It's highly repetitive, we see it often, and the deck spans directly to it. So our deck is going from here to here. So each one of these things is picking up a portion of the deck. Each one of these things is picking up the amount of deck halfway between its neighbors. So let's just take a look at this roof joist or one. Remember I said naming things is really important? You don't know that that means roof joist or one, but we do say it's the roof plan. J, probably a good name for joist. Once you see these things happen again and again and again, you'll see that there's leeway in how we name them, but they're pretty, usually pretty obvious. We try to pick a naming system that helps keep clarity to what we're doing. It helps us keep um, distinction between floors clear and even what roles things are playing. So if I have purlins, I might use a P here. If I have beams, I might use a B here. Again, girders, beams, and purlins are all just beams. I might use a beam or a letter B for all of them. And I would understand, and by the end of this term, you will understand that the hierarchy is about the role that it's playing. And you can look at that and see it. So let's look at RJ01, or this joist here. The deck is spanning from here to here, and we want to know what width of roof this joist is picking up. Well, it's spanning from this joist to this joist, and this is where I always say to people, you already understand everything you need to know. Intuitively, you know that half of this region of deck is going to this joist, and half of it is going to this joist. So half of this width of this zone of roof goes to this joist. You know that in this zone of roof, intuitively, half of it is going to this side and half of it is going to this side, which means half of this dimension is going to this joist. So somewhere from here to here, is going to be the width of roof that is loading that joist. Let's take a look at that. We've got a joist, and these joists look like they're every two meters apart. So that's two meters, that's two meters, and that's two meters. Half of this distance was one meter. So one meter of this zone is going to this joist. This side is two meters, and half of it is going to this joist. So one meter. So it looks like we've got one meter and one meter, or two meters of deck width are apl being applied a load to that joist. Or what we say is the tributary width of this joist is two meters. It's also, we can see here, eight meters long. The total tributary area, I think, is almost easier. You would understand that it is picking up that area, which is 2 meters by 8 meters, which is 16 meters squared. But for some reason, people have a hard time when we break it down to tributary width. So tributary width of RJ01, 2 meters. Tributary area, 
16 meters because it's our two meters times our eight meters. It looks like we have a few other joists that are two meters tributary width, eight meters long. Rather than design, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 16 of them. How about we design it once and name them all the same? You have to be careful with that because if you make a change later, you'd wanna make sure that that change didn't impact all of them, or if it did, that you grab that accordingly. Um, but for this, it looks like it would be easy to design that those 16 things once with a tributary width of two meters and a length of eight meters. Let's look at another element. Let's look at a beam. So let's look at RB01 or roof beam 01 because that's the first beam we're looking at. It looks like it is six meters long. It spans from grid line A to grid line B and each bay was six meters. Um, and this beam is picking up a portion of this roof. It looks like it's picking up all of these beams right here. So we would say it's picking up half of this joist and half of this joist. Essentially, it's picking up this zone of roof. I know that that's spanning into the column, but we'll often refer to it as the width of this zone. So half of the length of all of these beams framing into it. So we've got an eight meter length to our joists and we're saying half of that load comes onto this beam or eight divided by two is four meters. So our tributary width for RB01 is four meters and our length is six meters. So four times six is 24 meters squared. So our tributary area of RB01 is 24 meters. Tributary width is four meters. Tributary area is 24 meters squared. Take a second and look at the plan and see if you see any other beams that look like they have the same tributary width and the same length. I'm looking at it and I see five other beams. So these six beams look like they'd all be the exact same. They all have four meters of tributary width and they're all six meters long, meaning they have 24 meters of tributary area, 20, 20, 24 meters squared of tributary area. Let's look at another beam now. Let's look at RB02. RBO2 is going to pick up half of what these beams are carrying and half of what these beams are carrying. You can break it up into two steps if you want. You can say that it's picking up the four meters on this side and the four meters on this side, which is really saying that we're picking up eight meters here. So we've got eight meters of tributary width and our beam is still six meters long. So eight meters of tributary width, and then our tributary area is eight times six or 48 meters squared. And so we can see that drawn in there. And when I look at this, I know I can see two more beams that have the exact same tributary width and the exact same length, meaning also the same tributary area. So same tributary width and same length, we've got these two beams as well. So for this relatively uh, beam heavy diagram, we're down to designing just three things. I know you're probably asking about these two, these four beams on the end. We could go into that, but you can see those are all the same. So maybe we need to design four things instead of three things. So we had three, six, nine, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 20, 29, roughly 29, 29 to 30 elements, and we only had to design four things to complete that design. So finding these patterns can be really helpful as well. There's another major thing drawn in this plan, and that's our columns. 
Columns are often a lot easier to talk about a tributary about tributary area because it is everything that's it's picking up. Sometimes it's easier to talk about them by uh, the end of the beam they're picking up too. We can calculate these things in different ways. Um, let's take a look at column one. So column one, if you were just in, if you were looking at a table and you ignored, you guys can't see my hand if I touch the screen. If you ignored all of these five bays here and you just looked at this bay and I said, what percentage of this goes to each corner? And you intuitively know 25% goes to each corner. 25, 25, 25, and 25. You intuitively understand that. That's a thing you already know. It's as soon as I make you draw it and calculate it that your brain shuts down. So stop, look at it as if it was a simple thing, break it into sections if you need to, and start to analyze it that way. If you know that this intuitively is going to take 25% of that area, well, you know that that is cutting it there and there, or halfway between here and here, and halfway between here and here. This was eight meters, so we've got four meters. This was six meters. So we've got three meters, four by 12, four, four by three is 12 meters squared. So it looks like this C1 column is carrying 12 square meters of tributary area. And if we look at this, we can probably see a few other columns that are doing the exact same thing. We've got those four. Now let's look at C2. Let's just stop and do the exact same thing we did with C1. If we just looked at this grid right here, we would say one quarter of this went to C2. If we just looked at this, we would say one quarter of it went to C2. Well, let's just redraw that as that entire quarter of this and quarter of this drawn together. Or we've got halfway between A and B, plus halfway in between B and C. So this is three meters and this is three meters. So we've got six meters here times the four meters here. Six times four is 24. So we've got 24 square meters of tributary area loading this column. We've got four other columns doing, or three other columns doing the exact same thing. Let's look at column C3. And this is where I like to have you get in the habit of looking at how we draw out areas and think about things. So we have, if we wanted to break this down again, it's taking a quarter of this grid and a quarter of this grid. So this quarter and this quarter. We can draw that. It looks different than any of the other uh, shapes that we've drawn so far. So it's taking halfway between one and two. These are eight, so that's four meters and that's four meters, which means that entire distance is eight meters. And it's taking half of A to B, or three meters. Eight times three is 24 meters squared. So C3 is essentially identical to C2 for tributary area. If you wanted, you could clump them together. I probably wouldn't, mostly because where these are a different shape, even though they're the same tributary area, if we, if we um, had something change within the project, my guess is those two might end up different the easiest. And that's just experience and intuition. Um, also, you know, it's a different size square. I think maybe just to kind of keep our heads straight. You can do whatever you want. If you told me all of those were the same, I'd be fine with it. Um, I think I would keep them broken out. Um, even though they're both 24 meters squared, I think I would keep them out just so that I can keep track of what's going on. And it looks like we've got another C3 over there. Let's look at C4. Well, it's going to take a quarter of this grid, a quarter of this grid, a quarter of this grid, and a quarter of this grid, giving us 
this entire tributary area. We know that each of these bays are three meters, so we've got six meters here, and we've already figured out that that's eight meters. So we've got six times eight, or 48 meters squared. So C4 is carrying 24 or 48 meters squared, and we've got two of those. Essentially, when we're looking at our beams, we need that entire area drawn up with tributary areas. And then when we're looking at our columns, we want the same thing to happen. If you find it easiest, print off a copy of something and shade it in and draw those tributary areas in. I used to love to do that on really complex um, uh, kind of loading diagrams back before we had kind of really handy diagrammatic software. Um, I would keep a set of um, Crayola markers on my desk and I would literally draw that out for a beam plan and for a column plan so that I wouldn't lose track of any of my tributary area because I need all of it to get down somewhere. I need all of those beams to pick up some of the floor and, I, and maybe I need to do it with all the joists and then maybe I need to do it with all the beams and then maybe I need to do it with all the columns so that I'm not missing how load gets to each place. So here I've drawn out the, uh, the tributary area. So you can see that RJ01, we had a two meter tributary width and here's our tributary area. This is the component I told you not to worry about, but we're gonna learn to do that later in the term. And so I added it in here just in case anyone comes back and wants to take a look at it later. You'll be like, oh yeah, I know how to do that now. But really we're multiplying the tributary width by the load to see what linear load is on the beam. But we're gonna spend lots and lots of time doing that later in the term. What happens when we have a complex layout? How do we figure this out? This is where I said drawing that diagram is super handy. There is a question on your assignment where I actually recommend you draw it out in sections and then add the sections up to figure out what your total tributary area is. You might even need to multiply it by a load I've given you to find out what the entire compressive load on a column is. So let's take a look at BO2. It is picking up half of the load of all of these joists and it's picking up half of the load of all of these joists. That means that all of these beams actually end up being the exact same loading condition. You can see that the diagrams are identical. They're shifted on the beams. You could do this three times if you wanted, but you're gonna find that the tributary width is the same width regardless for these three beams. These two beams, they've all, these are all labeled BO1. I apologize, this should be BO1. Well, these are BO2, then BO3, BO4. But the color really kind of matches them up for you. So pay attention to the color ones. So all of the blue ones were identical, and these two green ones are identical. Where this load now is going to change along its length. We have a different tributary width at this end than we do at this end. And so that's a thing we're going to have to think about but it looks like we have two of them doing the same thing. Those two, the purple ones are doing the same thing and the orange ones are also doing the same thing. So if we take the time to draw this out for all of the beams, now remember, we'd wanna do this for the joists and then we'd wanna come back and overlay it and do it for all the beams and then we'd wanna come back and do it for all the columns as well. Let's take a quick look at this framing plan here where we've got some things in feet and inches um, and we've got some loads here. We're not going to worry about the loads too much right now. We might dig into them a little bit. And we want to look at the tributary width for, two, for L2J01 which is saying level two joist 01 at 16 inches on center. So they've told us that there's one of these joists spanning from here to here every 16 inches. 
rather than the reason they did that is rather than draw a line here and here and here and drawing a line every 16 inches and really cluttering up this drawing they've made that note instead so they've said uh, l2 j01 at 16 inches center to center and we want to know what the tributary width of that is well the tributary width for this um, is going to be half of the width of the roof it's or the floor it's carrying beside it on one side or the space half of the spacing to the joist beside it and half of the spacing to the joist of the other side if we've got these at every 16 inches one of these is going to pick up half of what's happening between these two or eight inches and then half of what's picking up picking up half of what's on the other side so eight inches and we've got eight inches and eight inches so the tributary width is 16 inches. So not only does it tell us that these things are every 16 inches, it tells us that the tributary width is half of each side, giving us 16 inches of tributary width as well. Let's look at the tributary width of uh, L2B01, or these beams right here. We can see that this length is 45 feet long. Let's just convert that into metric. We know that a foot has 12 inches, so let's take 45 and multiply it by 12. We get 540 inches. We know that a, uh, an inch has 25.4 millimeters in it, so we can multiply that by 25.4 millimeters. That gives us 13,716 millimeters. Sometimes it's easier to talk about these things in meters. So let's divide by a thousand. And we're going to get 13.716 meters. This entire length is 13.716 meters. Each one of these, so that means the distance between each one of these is a quarter of that. So let's divide that by four. The distance between each of these is 3.429 meters. We're pretty close to 3.4, but 3.429 meters. And we want to know the tributary width of any one of these. We know that it's going to pick up half of this and half of this. This was 3.429 meters, so it's going to pick up half of 3.429. And this side is going to pick up half of 3.429, meaning this entire width is going to be 3.429. So we'll get a tributary width for L2B01 of 3.429. I'm kind of going through this in a simple way. It's going to be written out for you um, in a page coming up. Let's take a look at LB02. This one's a little bit interesting because it's got joists framing into it in this direction, but it's parallel to the joists in this direction. We don't really know anything about these. They're probably something that's 16 inches on center. We're gonna learn that that's a pretty common thing for wood elements, but let's mostly worry about this then. We know that this is 11 foot eight. So let's take 11 and multiply it by 12 and then add in those eight inches. It means we've got 140 inches. We can multiply that by 25.4 to get our millimeters and then divide by a thousand to get our meters. This distance is 3.556 meters. These beams are picking up half of that. If you wanted, you could add in the, the, the 200 millimeters from the joists on this side, but let's mostly just worry about this. We know that it is picking up half of that. So our tributary width for L2BO2 would be 1.78 meters. And finally, let's look at L2BO6. L2B06 is picking up half of that. If I recall, we had 45 times 12 times 25.4 divided by 1,000 divided by 4, and it's picking up half of that, 
it's going to pick up 1.72 meters of tributary width. So again, I've done something here where I've calculated out a bunch of stuff. These are all of the steps we're going to learn later on. But take a look at this here. We have a, uh, a load here that somebody's given us that says 4.1 kPa. We haven't talked about it. We don't know much about that. But that is the load pushing down on that floor. We know that our tributary width of this was 16 millimeters. If we wanted to go a little bit farther and see what the line load was on that, we'd multiply our tributary width times our load and we get a line load. You don't have to do that. I might make you do one step of calculation in the uh, assignment, but you'll see it. It'll be relatively easy. I give it to you in a very simple, straightforward way. So this is here, but the big takeaway I want you to get is calculating these tributary widths. So these are those tributary widths we went through and calculated. Um, let's go back. I want to see that we got that for L2BO1. Um, we had 45 times 12 times 25.4 divided by 4 divided by 1,000. Yeah, so we were on track there. These are all the things that we calculated out ourselves. Grad students. Hi, grad students. Can you blow them all a kiss? Mm -hmm. Duncan, do you want to say hi to all the grad students? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, say hi, grad students. Hi, grad students. How old were you, Duncan? Two. Two? Are you two? Yeah. Oh, good job, buddy. Okay. So again, these, we're going to learn to do these calculations full out. This is going to be some of exactly what we do towards the end of the term. So don't look at this and think, what the hell, Shannon? You haven't taught us how to do this. How are we supposed to know? What I'm huh? looking for here is you calculating that tributary width and maybe multiplying it by a load if I gave it to you. But I'd be very explicit about that. We will learn to do this all the way through. And at the end of the term, if you want some practice problems, come back to these. This is a really good one to kind of keep in the back of your mind because you have some worked out solutions here. Essentially, for your um, part two of your project and your exam, this is what I'm going to be looking for. This is, gosh, I've given this to every year and no one has figured out, well, actually they have figured it out, but that this is really the ultimate thing that we're looking for is a beautiful little diagram like this. And then we take it further next term. So you guys are already one step ahead. You can see this here. This is the ultimate goal. This page, these pages are what we're working to be able to do. And I wanted to highlight for you that the step we need to know how to do right now is the tributary widths or tributary areas for columns. Kind of going forward in the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about figuring out what these loads are. So let's just briefly talk about the project. There's lots of time to get into it, but I want you to be getting your head around it. Part one is going to be picking a simple everyday object, and it needs to be something static. Now, we haven't talked about what static means, but static means it stays still. It doesn't move. A bicycle going down the street is not static. It moves. We want something staying still. If you want to do a bike, have it leaning against a bike post. It's kind of a boring object, but hey, that's you. You get to pick your object. The idea here is we're going to look at that object, or you're going to look at that object, and this isn't about complex math. It is about thinking about what an engineer would think about. These are not buildings. So I am acknowledging that these are not buildings, and the loads we put on buildings wouldn't be the right loads for these objects. You need to think about what might be a reasonable load to put on an object. I have often in the past, because 
um, like the, the second year I taught this, I switched the project to this format. And I had, when I went back to teaching, I had a six week old baby. Um, no mat leave for uh, somebody who owns their own company. Um, so I talked about a crib. What would I do if I was looking at a crib? It can be something simple. I've had people do teacups. I've had coat hangers. Um, in two different years, I've had people do bras. So you can get creative here. This is about thinking about how a thing behaves and what makes it static. How is it static? If I put my uh, crib on wheels, it's not static anymore. It can move this way if I lean on it. It's static for gravity loads, so that's one way it's static. But if I leaned on it, it's not static anymore. And I need to understand that, that we can have different, different systems or different states of being depending on what load we apply to it. So for the crib, I talked about, well, what loads might be in it? When whoever designed this crib, what were they thinking about? Well, obviously there's the weight of the crib itself. Um, so every element has its own self weight. And as you get down to the bottom of it, the legs are carrying their own self weight and all of the self weight of the object above it. Um, there's going to be a mattress in it. So we've got a weight of a mattress of some sort. We've probably got the key thing, a baby in that crib. So we need to think about the weight of a baby and what's reasonable for a weight of a baby, we don't know. But I don't know if any of you in this course have kids. Some years there are people with uh, children, some people, well, some years there aren't. Um, if any of you have kids or if you choose to in the future, there's going to be the night that your kid is heartbroken and you give up and you get in the crib with them. I gave up the other way. I just brought them into my bed with me. I was a co-sleeper. Um, but you might decide to climb into the crib with them. Well, whoever designed that, probably thought about the fact that that might happen because they knew that that, as much as it's a rare load case, is a reasonable load case to take place. So maybe they wanted to design it for an adult getting in the crib as well, which is a different load. That would be a much bigger load than the baby in the crib. And we're gonna talk later in the term about what is a reasonable load for a person. Not every person, but what is the load we tend to use to kind of designate a person load? And we're going to talk about that. I believe that is actually even next week. It might be in a few weeks, but when we talk about loads, that is like the first slide we talk about in our very first lecture about loads. Um, and then if anyone also has a kid, when you're feeling misty at night and they're asleep and they're not crying and there's no poopy diapers and in spite of how tired you are, you stand there and you... <sighs> lean dreamily looking in at them on the crib. You don't sigh like that though for, oh my God, if you woke them up, you'd lose your mind. But you stare longing at them, longingly at them while leaning on the side of the crib. That is a different load. You've got something pushing that way and pushing down simultaneously. And that's a reasonable load. What about when they're building the crib? What if it's turned on its side and the legs are cantilevered out? What are the different loads that this thing might experience? Maybe uh, it's mid COVID and you've got the crib outside and you've got um, some screens around the side so it's protected from the wind. Well, now there's a wind load on the crib. You'd wanna start thinking about all the unique ways that this thing could see a load. And we're gonna spend some time later in the term talking about free body diagrams, which is the way we simplify our object as a stick figure with all the loads and all the things it takes to keep it in place, reactions. And so you're gonna end up drawing these diagrams to tell me the story that your object is actually staying still. You need to make sure that your object is stable. And these diagrams are what shows you that the object is stable. You're not gonna have to do any math with these loads. I'm not asking for that. But if you wanted to, you're more than welcome to, but that is beyond the requirements of that part of the project. Part two of the project is going to be a building I give you with several elements for each person that you design. The reason I do this now, it used to be that you got to make your own building um, and there was no part one, part two. You made your own building and you analyzed your own elements. 
The problem there was is that some people picked very simple buildings and some people picked very complex buildings. And it made it very hard to mark the projects fairly. Because the point of this course, as much as I love creativity, isn't about creativity. It sadly comes down to the math. Um, and what I need to test you on is do you understand where the loads are going? And if you pick a complex system, it becomes very hard for me to know if you understand where the loads are going. Um, so that's why I break this into two parts now. The free body diagram and it kind of imagining the loads is the creative part. Uh, and then I give you a building so everyone is on the same page. Everyone's got the same kind of um, com complexity level on this project, part two, where you're actually essentially doing this for every, for those elements that I've given you. You're going to basically create these pages for those elements and then you'll upload them and I'll mark them. So today's takeaway tips, just you should know how to take a look at a set of structural drawings. It's not gonna come to you easy. Take those out, look at them. As we learn more throughout the term, those are gonna get clearer and clearer to you as well. It's gonna become more obvious what those things mean. There's hidden gems of information in there. Um, print those off. You might find that five years from now when you're doing a project, it might be handy because there's a healthy little tidbit of things in there that you didn't know uh, kind of crystallized in those drawings. Um, you need to be able to produce a set of structural drawings. I know that sounds terrifying right now, we're going to get better at it. We're going to look at more of them. Um, and that is more at the end of uh, semester two when you're doing comprehensive. One of the, the, the scope of that project is you actually have to be able to produce a set of structural drawings for your project. And then obviously you need to be able to calculate the tributary width um, for loading on a beam. And if someone gave you the load, know that you're multiplying that by the tributary width or for a column that you're multiplying it by the tributary area. And that's kind of the limit of the complexity of this course. So this one's more about, um, this one's kind of really hard to test on, um, but I tried to make the uh, assignment as straightforward as possible. It's sequent, like if you'll, you'll see that once you get the hang of what you're doing in this assignment, it will be pretty obvious. It looks very similar to some of those examples we just did. Um, read through it. Look at it a few times. Don't hit submit until you've taken a look. You guys can talk to each other about it too. Um, an assignment always would have been working together. I'm going to trust that you don't just call up your friend Joe and say, Joe, what's the answer? Again, I can't stop you from doing that, but the only person that's going to hurt is you because you'll get a good mark in the assignment and then not know how to do it in the exam, which is worth 40% of the mark. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to learn it in a very comfortable, uh, unpressurized time frame for your assignment um, so that you know how to do it in the exam when there might be a little more pressure. So take this opportunity. Um, should you choose to cheat, I can't stop you, but you're only going to end up hurting yourself. I hope, I can't imagine. You guys are awesome. You're not going to do that. I can't, I can't imagine you're going to do that. Okay, so next week I'm hoping I'm going to have things uploaded a little bit faster. This one was a big push because I had to create those drawings, which again, don't look like much to you, but that was about 40 hours of work when I'm trying to create all these lectures, create the assignments for my other course, create a quiz. I've had nine hours of online learning for my four-year-old, which is just a, a different kind of nightmare. Um, and also keep a house and do all the normal stuff that you guys all understand. And I know you guys are under this pressure too. So hopefully we'll all just be really nice to each other as this goes forward. So again, in the assignment, be very, very careful and read exactly what I need you to do. Um, I'll be back next week with the next installment of uh, our structural engineering lecture. All right, guys. Um, my screen is freaking out, so it's hard to see exactly where my buttons are, uh, but I can't wait to um, uh, do next week with you guys as well.